water. By intention. Maybe uh, there could be some other hidden factors. Yeah, there may, of course, there will be A, hey, there will be antecedent factors yeah. here. It may be envy, it may be greed, it may be something else, yeah. And somewhere, the antecedent factors we meet in the fact that Sheikh has a wife and a mistress. Maybe if he had had just the mistress. So he put this So he The intention does not come in there at all. Well, I know well for intention. This is actually more than intention. This is an attempt. Yeah. Yeah. But then it didn't happen. Aha. Uh -huh. So, I, now, well, I don't know what the law of the world says. Yeah. <laughs> but, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, that is fine. You. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we we need to, in case after your question we just move we change gear. Um, so please, I want to know we have moderating hmm. How do we get which one is moderating which one is Yeah. Okay. Can you give us? An example of a moderating, it doesn't have to, to be here, it doesn't have to be in this story. Give us a life example of mediating or moderating. Uh, yes. like, um, um, let's say school. The difference between this moderating mm. and mediating, I just want to understand when it comes to this. Okay, so who can help us? Just Sorry? Just thinking. Okay. No valid support. <laughs> I, from the use of words, mm. I feel mediating is positively influencing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we talk about the research questions and hypothesis tomorrow, we will talk about this, but it will not, we will not be using these terms we will see that our research question or hypothesis can focus on the X, trying to understand the cause. But then there are situations we have a cause. We are trying to understand the outcome. So research question can also focus on the outcome. Like if we say trader money is a policy, you may be interested in... Yeah. That is where some of these factors may fall. But then I think more uh, close to that is our research question that focus on the conditions yeah under which x leads to y so you hear research questions like under what conditions do online activism produce response from government officials in democratic whatever so it's not about the x it's not about the y it's about this environment under which end we are going to have factors that are Hello Africa, welcome to another edition of AU Talks. Our topic for discussion this morning is the diaspora as a resource to Africa's development. 
With me in the studio is Kerry, a retired English professor, Cindy, a teacher and entrepreneur, Sharon, legal assistant and family grilled. We'll go for a short break and when we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. The University of Khartoum is the oldest university in Sudan. It has a lot of faculties and this includes the science faculty. The science faculty has a lot of facilities and among them is the Microbial Culture Collection Unit, MCCU. The MCCU has two subunits, namely the Molecular Biology and the Microbiology Units. The Microbiology Units consists of the Culture Room and the Microbiology Lab. The Microbiology Lab is well equipped with state-of-the-art facilities to conduct analysis on bacteria and other microbes. The bacteria are then sent to the culture room for incubation based on two temperatures, that is the cold and the room temperature. There is also a freeze dryer that converts bacteria into powdery forms to be stored over time. The molecular biology unit is where DNAs are extracted using equipment such as microwaves. Other facilities of the unit include a sterilization room where all equipment used in the unit are sterilized. It is also where the microbes used in the various experiments are killed. A cold room where samples such as DNA and media are kept as well as a meeting room where seminars and experiments are done. Welcome back. My name is Irene and I'll be your host for today's program. Welcome to Ghana. How Thank is you. the experience? How is the experience? Wow, so we've been here since Monday, okay. um, and it's it's been an amazing experience. The Ghanaian family, we should call them, mm -hmm. uh, you guys, you have been hospitable, um, but it's just hot. So we left the U.S., <laughs> and we weren't this hot. We, we're managing to get by, but we are grateful for the love and the kindness that has been shown. Okay. Yeah, so um, what's it? Sharon, we wanted to talk about your family. Why are you here? Why are you in Ghana? We are here to celebrate my mother, Lucille Myrtle Johnson Simpson Hobson, <laughs> her 90th birthday. Yay. And I did her DNA, and she's actually 20% Ghanaian. Oh, we've seen her. Yes, yes. yes. So we're coming back home. Um, she said, and she had lived to see an African-American president, okay. President Barack Obama, mm -hmm. and she also wanted to travel to Africa. That's good. In her lifetime. So we brought her back home. Okay. So can you talk a little about your family genealogy since you are the family? Yes. Yeah. I have been working on our family history for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've been able to track our history back to 1835 on both sides mm -hmm. uh, with the use of Ancestry.com, census mm -hmm. reports, medical reports. I am actually at the point that I now have to investigate the slave voyages. Oh. Yes, That's and so it's close. yes, it is close. But now I have to um, figure out because you know they, since they were chattel, mm. they just identify them as male, female, and number of children. Okay. So I have to find out which ship they came over on. Um, one of the things I do know about our history is that um, my great great grandfather was taken from um, the islands, from the Caribbean, actually, okay. and they were taken to. Virginia, and then they were transported to Alabama and given the surname of Johnson. This is my mother's uh, great-grandfather. Um, so I have to go from that point and then track it back. But it has been an amazing experience because she is Ghanaian, and some people even say that we look like Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. Right. It's true. And your name, when we choose your name in Ghana, it means you have Fanti because you have the Johnson, the Thompsons, and all of that. Yes. <laughs> You, you are you are the right place, mm. maybe from Cape Coast. Oh, oh wow! Yes. So, how, uh, which places did you go? Have you visited? Since we you went to Cape po Coast okay. yesterday. Um, we had lunch at the university. Mm. Then we drove to Elmina Castle mm. to see the slave castles. How was the experience over there? Uh, heartbreaking. Yes. Um, it was it was unimaginable, mm -hmm. you know, when when you go through and you just realize that your ancestors passed through what they had to endure. We went through the small caves, we yeah. went to the holding caves, we yeah. went to the, 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 the return. Yes, yes, 
and it's, I mean, you just had a pensive moment. It, I mean, it almost makes you want to cry because it's, it's very sad that you're not going to return, you're going to leave your family. And you think about, and, and it's against your will, you know, it is just not by choice. And just to be ripped apart. And I remember during our family reunion, when I told it this time, because usually we do a presentation, but when I told it this time, I wanted it to come to life because a lot of the younger generation, you know, they have lost touch. Mm -hmm. You know, they are yielding the benefits of that journey, but they don't understand the journey. Mm -hmm. So this time, um, we had a three-part series, and it was entitled Our Roots Run D Deep. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of our um, brochure, Our Roots Run D Deep, and Our Ancestors' Wildest Dreams. Mm -hmm. And the first part, I enacted. So it was like a dinner theater. So I was the connecting point. Mm -hmm. And as I told the history, I had background PowerPoint presentations. I actually had um, cotton so they could tell. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had, we had a slave doll. Mm -hmm. And just to bring it, to make it come to life. Mm -hmm. The second part was called Way Out of No Way. And I had people like my mother's generation mm -hmm. tell their stories about how God made a way out of no way and how they made it through. Mm -hmm. And then I had their children read it because you want to cement that. Mm -hmm. And then the last part was called Our Ancestors' Wildest Dreams. Mm -hmm. So I had people like my niece, Cindy, mm -hmm. talk about her accomplishments, my daughter, that generation. And Cindy at the time wasn't able to attend, but she sent this amazing video. Mm -hmm. um, and she goes through everything that she's accomplished, and then at the conclusion, she'll go down through the lineage, and then she concludes and says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted that journey to connect from the roots to the present. Yeah. Carrie, so this is real. This is not being reenacted, but you came to feel it. How important yes. is this journey for you and your family, the trip you took to Ghana? Um, it's very important because so many people, so many African Americans had no desire to mm -hmm. come to Africa. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go there. I'd rather go to Greece or I'd rather go to Italy, something like that. And I think the more of us who come here and then we come back and say, it's not what you see on TV. Yeah, right. um, I was very emphatic about bringing my, my granddaughter who was eight mm -hmm. so that she will never develop the attitude that the media presents yeah. us with. So she will always, the first thing she said, uh, there's going to be lions there, there's going to be... And I had to, yeah, and I had to keep telling her, it's not going to be like that. She said, um, where are we going to sleep? We're gonna, I said, it's not going to be like that. But that's what's portrayed, even at her age, eight. Yeah. Um, she doesn't have that, you know, if you ask her about France or something, she's not going to say anything like that. Yeah. But... Africa. This is our home. And this is a real place with real people, with yeah. professions, houses. Um, and I want her to know that at an early age so she doesn't have to relearn it later. Yeah. She knows now so she can move forward. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. and one thing Ghana especially is doing is opening up to the diaspora so that they come. So last December we had the full circle. Mm -hmm. And then we had all the celebrities coming down to Africa to feel what Africa is and Ghana especially. At least we have a good name. The yes. media hasn't really skewed it so bad for us, mm -hmm. which we are trying mm -hmm. to also project what Africa is like because they will tell you this country is not safe, but it is not the situation mm -hmm. on the ground. And since you are here, you could testify mm -hmm. yeah. to that fact. Mm -hmm. And so going on to our discussion, who are the diaspora? You really want to go deep into that, who are the diaspora? I think the diaspora is anyone of African descent mm -hmm. um, that have been taken to other nations, other countries, and that are residing there. So whether or not if you are a in the Caribbean, if you are in Paris, or if you're in the United States, Canada, you and you are a person of African descent, you are black, you are a part of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are so many people like you, you could find your mother's uh, genealogy and you could trace it back to 
um, Ghana, and she's yes. twenty percent Ghanaian. <laughs> yes, which we accept gladly. <laughs> yes. So, I wanted to know what are some of the challenges of people finding their roots back to Africa? Is there some challenges that you face when you want to find your route to Africa? Well, it's um, it's a cost thing as well. Okay. It's not inexpensive to come to Africa. It's mm. a major um, funds outlay. Mm. Uh, and mm. so a lot of people find that prohibitive. Mm. Um, the other thing mm. is we haven't been taught to love ourselves the way that we should. And um, so then you get the attitude, well, I don't want to go there. Mm. You know. um, what do, what do you and, the, and the other part is our inability to make that connection. Yeah. Okay, Only because I did my mother's DNA did we find out more specifically mm -hmm that she came from Ghana. Mm -hmm. My oldest sister did um, uh, a DNA report previously and it was just more general. Yeah, that mm -hmm. was earlier that was in many, the genome project. That was earlier. Right. And the only thing they could give me was uh, a region. A trace, yeah, a trace of the um, migration mm -hmm. across the continent and then but no specifics. Mm -hmm. She has more specifics. Yeah, and now that you have more specifics, you have more interest. Because, as I said, you know, I'm able to track it, and I'm at the slave journals right now. Yeah. So you have to do a lot more digging. And mm -hmm. there are resources. There are in the uh, libraries. There are actual uh, societies, mm -hmm. and they've done this before. So, you know, you have to connect yourself with that organization mm -hmm. and, and just use Freeman's Bureau. There's a lot of resources. It's a lot of work, though. It's, yeah. it's not easy. But the desire to reach out is so much better when you have that DNA and you can specifically make that connection. Mm -hmm. So you can go there, you know, I was approaching it from this part. Okay. Now I can approach it from mm -hmm. the Ghanaian part. Mm -hmm. And so, yes. and, and that gives me a broader reach. Yeah. I, I, oh. yeah, I also feel like the transatlantic slave trade component runs deep. Mm -hmm. And so we've been separated all across the world and like my mother said, we were literally taught to not appreciate who we authentically are mm -hmm. and where we come from. So therefore, Africa is projected to us in a certain way, so we don't want to claim that's where we're from. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to be renamed and restructured mm -hmm. so that we can begin to have our ancestry trace. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Cindy, since you are the younger generation, <laughs> wanted to know so what are you putting in place because soon they will be out and then you would start building your generation to what would you do for you those coming after you to have that feel that this is where they belong to and sometimes even resettling to African countries what do you have in mind what do you plan on doing so my mother, when I was in sixth grade, so about 12 years old, mm. she sent me um, to South Africa with People to People, mm. student ambassador, and we program, and we spent maybe about a month in South Africa at the time, and I was only 12 years old. That isolated um, memory for me has been lasting, and it shaped I'm 35 now. It shaped me into who I am today. So I've always had this quest for Africa. Mm -hmm. I ended up going um, to graduate school to study Pan-African Studies. Okay. Um, I've been to Senegal, and now I'm here. And so I, I have this yearning to find out exactly where I'm from mm -hmm. and to to pass it on to my children mm -hmm. and to end up, you know, going back or perhaps moving back one day. And I think it's my responsibility, having had a mother who instilled that into me, to pass it on to the children I teach so that they can one day do the same thing. So what I do is I am right now, actually, my students are, um, they are studying African fables. Um, and we've studied Africa um, and the different continents and tribes. And we've taken like Anansi, the spider, yes. and we're reenacting the, those things. And we, we, we're looking at videos of Africa. So that they, at, I teach elementary age um, children, at that age can develop, start developing their love for it. Yes. And then it'll grow as they grow. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that little part of um, you know 
interest I invoke into them, they it will follow them the rest of their tenure in school. Yeah. So that, that's very important. Yes. When we have in the United States, I'm sure you have it here too, a canon. We yes. call it the canon. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been very difficult, first of all, to get African American writings into the canon. Okay. And so um, they've been forced into the canon. So now, now that you see what, what you must read to be considered educated, mm -hmm. you know, so we have some African American authors there. But we need some African, yeah. African, Ghanaian. Yeah. We need more names yeah. in the canon that are African. Um, one reason everybody wants to go to London is because most of the authors are English yeah. in the canon. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what you're reading. Mm -hmm. you know? And so what Cindy has done is very important because there are other stories out there, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Yes, it's true. When she was talking about Spider-Man, right, I'm exactly. not saying as, as a rich history of mm -hmm. folk tale and Africa right, and right. Ghana, for instance, right. and we couldn't even develop it to this, then to that. It is now... Mm -hmm. Foreignized. Right. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man. Right? Yes. And push these. Wow. We have to Teaches push these us things. a lot of right. things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we need the wisdom from Anna and right. all the things that when right. we were young, we were taught. Yeah. 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 And these are some of the things that they are lacking because they are not here with right. us in right. Africa. And that's, that's the sad part. Mm -hmm. In America, the children reference Spider-Man, yes. but don't equate it with it being a Nazi mm -hmm. the spider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that was stolen from Africa mm -hmm. that is claimed as something totally different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In case you just tune in, this is AU Talks. We'll go for a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our discussion. You can watch us live on Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube and also on TV at aau.org. Stay tuned. Botswana Accountancy College is a business school that was set up over two decades ago to contribute towards the human capital development in Botswana and beyond. BAC has over 20 years diversified its product portfolio to offer accounting, business, leisure, management and ICT related programs at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, as well as consultancy short courses to augment professional skills. In achieving this diversification, the college has partnered with UK-based universities of Durban Sunderland and Sheffield Hallam University, as well as professional bodies such as SEMA, Beaker, AAT, ACCA, CIA, Cisco, Microsoft, SAP, ESA, and SIPS to allow our graduates to have a globally recognized qualification and be globally competitive. To learn more about BAC, contact us on 3953062 in Gaborone or 2410558 in Francistown or visit our website on www.bac.ac. BW. Also, you can visit our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. BAC, celebrating over 20 years of creating business leaders. Welcome back to AU Talks. We are talking about the diaspora as a resource to Africa's development. Um, we are talking about you coming down to Ghana, and we acknowledge that when the full circles came to Ghana, there was a lot of improvement in our economic resources, especially because they invested in the tourist sites mm -hmm. and all of that. And so we wanted to know, are there policies that, that attract you to come to Africa? Or you just come because maybe you found your route that you are coming? So are there existing policies like that to attract the diaspora to come and look into Africa over there? Well, one thing, uh a lot of people will c come to Africa, say, on a mission, mm. um, and they'll come back and say, well, my church built a well, yes. or, or my church bought mm -hmm. a generator. Um, one thing I would like to see is some kind of central place. Mm. For example, when I was coming here, I wanted to find if there was an American church here, you know, that, yeah. Some, sometimes Americans come here and actually form mm -hmm. congregations. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I was unable to find that. Mm -hmm. um, someone said, well, you have to call every church. I, I wish there was some kind of central place um, where there was a listing of what's been done, mm -hmm. also what needs to be done. Yeah. Sometimes the stars come and 
they say, well, I went to Africa and I began a school. I started a school. Yeah. Um, so when they say Africa, they're not it's saying, the like, is it Senegal? Is <laughs> right. it yeah. Ghana? So is huge, it Nigeria? Yeah. Where is it? You know, I would like to see, and I also would like to see that central thing because I might want to start a, to, to fund something. Mm. So I, I live in the United States. I'm, I'm not sure what you need in Ghana. Mm. But perhaps there is something in Ghana that I could actually rally my friends around mm. and we could fund that, come here and do that thing. Yeah. Um, we have no way of knowing um, what we can do. You know, we have resources. Mm. I keep telling people African Americans are not poor. Yeah. There was a time we were poor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we are not poor, yeah. um, and we can. And there's so many fundraising um, outlets yeah. in America that if we wanted to fund a project, say, like I was thinking about um, the stalls where the the vendors are. Mm. If we wanted to build stalls for them, um, there should be some way that we connect could connect with someone yeah. and say. We want to come there and build stalls. Yeah. Who who do we see about that? How much would that cost? Who will we need? We don't have that kind of resource. I don't know about um, U.S., but I know the foreign affairs have the diaspora section mm -hmm. where they normally organize programs for the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you invested mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. At least you will know what is going on and how you could help. So right. the foreign affairs session of the um, have a diaspora session mm -hmm. where you can go and there are so many things that we could do you could do to help mm -hmm. yeah because um yeah as you said you are very rich <laughs> and we know not very rich you know, <laughs> <not very, not laughs> because the, the black americans control the entertainment and that's a huge investment exactly. right yeah so you, you have someone that oprah comes yeah. She says, I built a school yeah. in Africa. Mm. And in the African American's mind, mm. that doesn't translate to a country in a city. Exactly. It just con it's just it's like Africa. Continent. Right, mm. the entire continent. Af you know, it, it, does, it doesn't have the true meaning yeah, of location. I, I find it intriguing <laughs> when they say, I'm going to Africa. Africa. Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Where right. in Africa? Mm -hmm. Right. We have right. about 54 <laughs> states. Right. 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 Exactly. 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 Where are you going? Mm -hmm. And and you know what else I would like is if there was a connection like for family reunions mm. to come as a group. Yeah, if we could have a good. central point here yeah. and for people, especially when they find out their DNA, yeah. you know, they can just come and make a connecting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that would just be an excellent uh, long-term, short-term, you know, mm -hmm. trip. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think that the full circle, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it would be a yearly thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's somehow expensive because those who are coming are affluent. Mm -hmm. They have their <laughs> own money. So I'm sure people can get involved with that. Mm -hmm. And so with that, the visa processes and all of that are being relaxed so that they can come and enjoy what is in Ghana. And so since you are here and since you've, you've come here, I would want to ask again, what has been your perception? Has it changed or is it still somehow? Yeah. Well, you know, someone asked me what my expectations were and I told mm -hmm. them I didn't have any. Okay. okay? I didn't want to come with preconceived okay. um, because I didn't know. I had no idea what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a connection of what's happening here mm -hmm. to any city in the United <laughs> States. Okay. Um, just Cindy and I were talking about it this morning on the way in. Uh, you know, there are sections. There are affluent sections. Yes. There are uh, less affluent <laughs> sections. Um, so, I mean, we can just match mm -hmm. apple for apple. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really is the same. It's just the volume of people. It's different mm -hmm. in the cities, but if we were in New York, it would probably be normal for them. We were, we were comparing mm -hmm. to New York yesterday. Okay, yeah. Yeah. that would be very normal for New York with that volume. So it depends on just like which region you're mm -hmm. in. Um, coming from, I'm in Charlotte now. Okay. So Charlotte is a smaller, mm -hmm. and Pittsburgh was even smaller, mm -hmm. okay? But when my daughter, my daughter went to Columbia, so when I would go in New York, <laughs> it was just like, it was exactly what is happening yeah. every day, every day, even the traffic. <laughs> the, the, the challenging, the traffic here, 
It's just like <laughs> I, and that's something I did not expect. I expected to come to a city just like because having been to Africa before, yeah. you know, I those preconceived notions that a lot of um Americans or people across the world think about Africa than I have. So I just expected to be in a normal city. I did not expect yeah. the traffic. Yeah. Oh um, like, I did not. You are in the wrong city. Yeah. Yes. You need to go to the smaller regions, mm -hmm. which the traffic is quite moderate. Mm -hmm. But this is the capital city, and so it is expected. Yes. Really expected. Yeah. It's so bad. The traffic is so bad here. But we are improving our road systems. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure by the time you come back, we'll be good. <laughs> yeah, so anything to talk on that your perception? Is well, it, has it been positive or negative? Oh, well, this is my third trip to the continent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first time in Ghana. Um, but I was impressed with the roads. Um, because, um, of course, in South Africa, it's a lot like America. But a lot is rural. You know, um, Accra is so cosmopolitan. Yeah. So I was, um, I was really impressed with. I mean, it's a lot of traffic, but the roads are smooth. There's no yes. potholes. I don't even see accidents. The, though. There's, there's very few accidents. <laughs> there should be. I, I'm telling, there I'm should you, be accidents. When we are driving and we'll go in another lane and come back. I was just like amazed at how close these cars were, and there have been no accidents the whole time. I'm yeah, just we like didn't amazed. Run into anything. And yeah. also, our driver went around the potholes. You guys might not have seen it, but he went around. He was taking very good care of us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And people are extremely polite. Yeah. Oh my, oh, gracious, respectful. Yeah. It is just. Oh, I'm. You know, I'm. I, okay. No, I mean, you, you just. It's. 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 In, it's. It, it's. It's part of the DNA. Yeah, <laughs> it, and it is, and, and it feels comfortable. It feels normal. It's, mm -hmm. uh, we should be that courteous. Yeah. All the time. It shouldn't. Even when they're this close. Yes. They're yeah. courteous. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So that was how we were brought up. I mean, yes. That is how you're also bringing up your Jota. Uh, not quite. <laughs> we have something called road rage. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Road rage. In the US, road rage. Yes. yes. People actually shoot other people over traffic. Yes. So it's so nice to come here and there's no rage. No. Mm -hmm. No one's giving you the finger. Mm -hmm. No one's hopping out their car and yeah. banging on your window. Yeah. That happens it's one or twice. Well, right? yeah. <laughs> well we didn't see Not it. No. One or two. good for the company. One or two. Because normally when you hit someone's car, you would be in so much trouble. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to be spending a lot of money. <laughs> right. Because sometimes the person has not insured this car. You don't want to take that responsibility. Right. And so you need to be careful, yeah. extremely careful. And so AAU, the APES of African Education, Higher Education, we are interested in the diaspora because we know there are things that you can do to help universities. Mm -hmm. How can the diaspora help Africa education in your own small way, in your own terms? I'm How can we benefit? I'm very interested. So coming here, when I left home, a lot of people said, Cindy, can you please get me some fabric? Oh. <laughs> that everybody wanted fabric. They wanted it from the continent. They wanted fabric. And I said, yes. When we go to these markets, so much stuff. So much beautiful stuff. And I think that it's imperative for us studying entrepreneurship mm -hmm. to come to the continent and gift it back. Yeah. Like, because in Ghana alone, you guys are selling everywhere yeah. things that we don't have access mm -hmm. to. And if I could at home get on the internet, yeah. look for a specific company yeah. at the market and order my six yards of fabric and have it sent to me, yeah. I think that will will help with econ economics, right, yeah. for yeah. your country. And so I think um, if we're studying it in college, and it's so much um, like programming in D.C. alone for black businesses and small businesses, yeah. if we give back what we've learned yeah. mm -hmm. and help people set up to be available and have access to you guys internationally, yeah. then that would be of 
major help mm -hmm. to the African region. Um, you know, my daughter is currently at Harvard getting her MBA, and at the conclusion of her first year, they're going to apply what they learned. They're going to New Delhi. They're going to Thailand <laughs> and Taiwan, and they need to come to Ghana. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, that yeah, needs exactly. to be one of the one of, the one of exactly that, that needs to be. I, I mean, I will talk to her mm -hmm. and see how that can happen. But if you add your name to that list, because yeah. every class, yeah. that's what mm -hmm. they do. She mm -hmm. said, "Mommy, it's 80 percent travel." Mm -hmm. She did go to Egypt, but it was for pleasure. It wasn't part of the curriculum. Okay. But if it's 80 percent travel, you should be a part, in that 80 yeah. percent somewhere. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we had a perception about Egypt that, oh, terrorists mm -hmm. working, so you're supposed to be scared, and we had the opportunity to visit there in March, mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. We go to the airport and said, are we in Africa? <laughs> because it was beautiful. We thought we were outside. Everything is good. You walk on the street, six-lane street, mm -hmm. flyovers everywhere. So minimum traffic, beautiful buildings. Mm -hmm. The architecture is so beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then we were in our corners thinking that Egypt is scary because yeah. of how the exactly. Western media has painted right. Egypt right. to foreigners. And so people are even scared to invest in Egypt. But this is a country where you can freely live and there is no problem. They are an Islamic country. But you are a Christian, you can live like yeah, how exactly. you want to yes. be. There is so much freedom, but they tell us, no, don't go to yeah, Egypt. Right. Right. It's so scary because there has been one or two at the Sinai. But it happens at Wednesday. Sure. Why is it not painted in that way? And mm -hmm. so we would want to encourage, since mm -hmm. you are here, since yes. you are mm -hmm. here, to also spread the good news of Absolutely. Yes, life. for sure. Spread we definitely have to change the narrative. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. And you were asking what could we do, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. one thing you all could do yeah. um, is make sure we get your literature, sure. you know. Um, I don't know, but there's a New York Times bestsellers list, maybe we need an Africa bestsellers yeah. list, yeah. Yeah. Um, to make sure that we get your literature because that's how we learn a yes. lot of An things. An interesting thing is that our literature is only just about 1.2 million of mm. all the literatures in the world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that is so scandalous. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And you can't reference those mm -hmm. because we are not even interested in that. Mm -hmm. We want the Karl Marxists, those who are dead and then don't even know mm -hmm. what is going on. Mm -hmm. right. 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 That mm -hmm. is what we are looking mm -hmm. at. And so it's time now, I think we look into ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and believe in what exactly. we are doing. And exactly. so the Africa Union has the Agenda 2063. They give a, a guideline as to what we want Africa to be in mm -hmm. the next 50 years. And so they titled it The Africa We Want. Mm. It's such an interesting document mm -hmm. that when you go through a hard seven salient point where you could see that they want to bring the realness of Africa yes. right. into that. And so we are encouraged all of us to go read the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063. And that is what the AAU is doing now. Mm -hmm. okay. We use these talks to promote the Agenda 2063, the continental. We have our own educational <laughs> strategy, <laughs> right, right? Right. Yes, in which we are doing. But we still talk about the UN goals, the SDGs. Sure. We don't talk about the Agenda mm -hmm. 2063. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And so it's like our priorities are not in sync with what we do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we are glad that you are here. Yeah and to help us and so before we go we'll give you the last words okay. we will start with sharon sharon what do you want to say <laughs> I, I like that yes yes well one of the things i want to say as as i listened to my sister and she talked about the information we received yes uh, we have to research it ourselves mm -hmm. okay we have to be the source we have to take responsibility and get the information ourselves and make the connection because um, it is out there we are connected, and we can't have anyone else be responsible for our history. Mm -hmm. It is our history, and we have to take ownership of it, and we have to make sure it is uh, expressed accurately mm -hmm. and not skewed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I just want to say that to Africans and Africans across the diaspora that we are a family, yes. and that we have to redirect our narrative 
And we have to love ourselves and love the country that we're from and give back to that country and go back to that country. Yes. And in order for us to do that, we have to tell our stories, we have to research our stories, and we have to begin healing. Mm -hmm. And to do that is to lean on one another. Mm -hmm. So don't overlook each other. Mm -hmm. Reach out, love on each other, grab a hand, come back, and serve. And I guess I want to say that we are Africans, and we have the best minds. Mm -hmm. We have the best minds out here. And if we could just bring our young along, seeing us be our best. Um, and, and knowing their history. We could teach them their history. They are the best minds. They come from us. Um, we women, we give birth to greatness. Uh -huh. And if we know that, We'll take better care of ourselves mm -hmm. if, we, if we if we put that first. You know that we are creating the best the world has to offer, and so if we if we can instill that in our, ourselves and mm -hmm. our youth, it would be such a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> yeah. and I enjoyed yes. our conversation. We wish you a fruitful stay. And we wish that you come during the Christmas so that we enjoy the festivities. Oh, oh, yes. oh yeah, that would be great. Yes. That would be great. Interesting. Thank you so much for joining us on AU Talks. You can watch us on our Facebook page, Association of African Universities. Have a good day. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa. Djibouti a abrité, du 18 au 26 février 2019, l'atelier sur les centres d'excellence de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique, ainsi que le ACE Impact Bootcamp. Plus de 400 participants, représentant 12 pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et du Centre, dont Djibouti, y ont pris part. We are here in Djibouti today to really prepare our centers, particularly the new ones, and to also have um, learning exchange, knowledge exchange between the existing ACE centers and also the new ones to ensure that knowledge is transferred um, very well. And we look forward to having so many experts here with us, also helping to help these centers develop their plans that will help them for the next five years, which is the duration of the project. And we are looking to the fact that um, this project will make a significant impact on the African continent in the various priority sectors that the centers will be providing um, training in, in terms of PhD training, master's training, and also in short-term um, professional courses as well as applied research um, and also linking them up to various partners in Africa and around the world. Il s'agit d'une collaboration étroite entre le ministère de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche de Djibouti, l'association des universités africaines et la Banque mondiale. L'association des universités africaines a eu à coordonner toutes ces activités qui ont donné les résultats que nous savons aujourd'hui et qui ont amené la Banque mondiale et l'Agence française de développement à financer une deuxième phase en Afrique de l'Ouest et en Afrique du Centre, plus Djibouti. 
et qui se dénomme euh, euh, CA Impact. Et nous attendons à ce que CA Impact ait vraiment des impacts par rapport à la formation, à la recherche et également au développement même de l'enseignement supérieur en Afrique. C'est la première fois qu'on est à Djibouti, on a rassemblé plus que 400 euh, scientifiques académiques euh, qui travaillent sur l'amélioration de la qualité euh, de l'enseignement supérieur euh, en Afrique. Donc le centre d'excellence, c'est un projet qui, qui vise à révolutionner le, les universités africaines et montrer comment il y a le talent académique et technologique euh, en Afrique et ce qu'il faut, c'est vraiment développer et investir dans ce talent. It's a co-financing between the World Bank and AFD to support a large-scale program in West Africa to enhance the capacity of training and research in postgraduate Uh, in uh, almost uh, in 12 countries and uh, to develop uh, 44 uh, centers of excellence. And we've been uh, in uh, Djibouti for several days. There's more than 400 uh, uh, scholars and uh, directors of our centers of excellence and experts uh, gathered here in Djibouti in order to prepare the project in order for them to to be aware of what they will achieve for the project. Lancé par la Banque mondiale en 2014, le projet des centres d'excellence africains vise à appuyer des filières de l'enseignement supérieur spécialisées dans les domaines des sciences, technologies, ingénierie et mathématiques, mais également l'agriculture et la santé. Ce financement de la Banque mondiale est un grand atout pour nous. Ça nous a permis de renforcer nos infrastructures pédagogiques et de recherche, d'acquérir des équipements de nouvelle génération qui vont nous permettre d'être très compétitifs en termes de recherche, en termes d'expertise et en termes de services à rendre à la communauté et aux acteurs du secteur de la filière avicole. Nous avons eu des défis, ce n'est pas que du succès, nous avons eu des défis. Les premiers défis auxquels nous avions fait face dès le début des centres d'excellence, c'est la maîtrise des procédures de la Banque mondiale. Les centres d'excellence sont une solution régionale innovante destinée à rendre l'enseignement supérieur plus pertinent pour le développement de l'Afrique. And uh, throughout the uh, uh, meeting, a lot of insights were provided for us, uh, answers were provided, roadmaps were provided on how to move our centers forward. The bootcamp achieved the objectives for which it was uh, uh, put together and I believe that at the end of the day, uh, most of us are going back fully prepared, fully energized and uh, with all the tools that uh, we need to be able to write uh, very good uh, implementation plans and moving forward to be able to follow up on how we can best implement these implementation plans. The first edition of the African Higher Education Fair was held on May 7, 2018 at the International Institute of Water and Environment Engineering, 2IE, in Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso. L'objectif de ce salon, c'est que euh, l'université qui était dans sa tour d'Ivoire vient maintenant en ville. Et c'est une occasion pour les centres d'excellence de montrer ce qu'ils savent faire, ce qu'ils ont acquis comme résultat et expertise. Centers of Excellence of the nine West and Central African countries came to present their training and research programs to the students and professionals present for the occasion. Cette journée-là est une innovation, une innovation encouragée parce que ça donne l'opportunité non seulement de nous connaître aussi, 
parce que euh, cette fois-ci, c'est parler de ce que fait le centre d'excellence, pas forcément des résultats du centre d'excellence. Et aussi, ça permet aussi de faire venir nos étudiants. Nos étudiants sont nos meilleurs ambassadeurs. The students were able to gather information that will enable them to plan the continuation of their university studies. Je trouve que c'est une bonne initiative parce que souvent certains étudiants cherchent à changer d'horizon, mais ils n'ont pas forcément l'occasion de connaître certaines universités. Bon, c'est bien pour les universités de se faire connaître, mais aussi pour les étudiants de, de découvrir de nouvelles universités. There are 22 African centers of excellence, universities, schools, research institutes. They all want the quality of African higher education to be recognized beyond its borders. Être centre d'excellence, c'est des exigences. C'est être à des standards internationaux. Être centre d'excellence, c'est avoir des formations qui soient accréditées. Non seulement au niveau national, au niveau régional, mais surtout au niveau international. This excellence will allow students to easily find a job that will contribute to the development of Africa. After school, you know, they should be able to gain employment. And how can they gain employment? If, if industry recognizes our, our, let's say, our programs and our products are very good, they are competent and they can deliver, I mean, getting a job will not be a problem. African centers of excellence develop themes related to the relevant needs of each country. Each enriches these areas of knowledge by producing competent human resources and promotes the creation of technologies that meet the challenges that Africa faces. We need to develop an expertise. People who have the knowledge, the know-how, uh, the technical know-how to be able to uh, develop systems and manage them uh, for society and for humanity. It's not just a label, but it's also in fact, uh, the rigor c'est de l'excellence dans la formation, dans la recherche et dans le process même en fait pédagogique. Since 2014, higher education institutions that have become centers of excellence have had their work and commitment to development recognized. In terms of what we do, we should stand out in terms of quality, you know, and of course uh, in terms of staff, we need to also get the caliber of staff, competent staff to do teaching and research. The African Higher Education Fair was a first for all African centers of excellence. It enriches this project financed by the World Bank and managed by the Association of African Universities. Le projet c'est un grand partenariat entre euh, surtout les, les neuf gouvernements qui sont partis du, euh, du, euh, du projet, la Banque mondiale et c'est géré euh, au niveau de la région de, de l'Association des universités africaines qui gère euh, qui font tout le suivi, évaluation, tout le, le renforcement de capacité des universités. Twice a year, the African Centers of Excellence meet for workshops to further reflection on this project. The workshop has been put together by the Association of uh, African Universities. They've been the ones who have been mentoring us and giving us tremendous uh, support. The first African Higher Education Fair offers new and diverse perspectives. It has strengthened the relevance of the network of African centers of excellence and its vision to promote higher education for development. Et ça fait maintenant quatre ans qu'on qu a ce projet. On voit qu'il y a un grand dynamisme dans les universités. Et ça, c'est important pour nous de montrer que l'Afrique peut. The World Bank project, the support that we're getting from AAU, is showing us that it is possible for us across the Anglophone and Francophone Africa to collaborate and share things and build up on our strengths to improve development in the, in the South Carolina.
Hello Africa, I am Frank Asifua, your host on today's edition of AU Talks on AU TV. Today we will be discussing the higher education space in the Gambia and the role of International Open University, the Gambia. After the break, I will introduce my guests and we will delve into this discussion. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, KinoFlow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming equipment, among others, you are sure to get the best of productions. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Ligon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board, or contact the AAU Studios via the following email addresses, info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, or ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on plus 233-244-736280. Hello, welcome back to this edition of AU Talks on AU TV. Today we'll be discussing the higher education space in Africa and um, the higher education space in Africa with the focus on Gambia and the role of International Open University. I am Frank Asifua, your host, and today with me in the studio to discuss this topic is uh, former uh, Honorable Dr. Mariama Sasesi. She is a former Minister of Higher Education and Scientific Research in the Gambia and she's currently the uh, Vice Chancellor of the International Open University. Madam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Doc, we would want to know a little bit about you. So, can you tell us a little bit about you? Hi. Yes, my name is Maria Masarsise, mm -hmm. a Gambian, born in the Gambia, bred in the Gambia, and uh, I studied everywhere in the world. First, uh, went to Nairobi to do a first degree and proceeded to New, Ze New Zealand to do a second degree and then all over the world. Nice. And the United States and UK. And uh, I'm a policy analyst data analyst okay and uh, i worked both at the international and the local level at the forum for international women's educationalists in nairobi then i came back before the tenure and then stayed on then married before boys mm -hmm. nice yes Congratulations. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> yes, Thank please. you. So, Doc, uh, yeah. you seem to have an extensive knowledge of higher education in the Gambia, and we need your expertise to help us to understand the scope and the terrain in Gambia in terms of higher education. Now, what would you say is the state of higher education in the Gambia? Let's start with a short historical background. Okay. When I came back home, Mm. I was engaged as a consultant in the Gambia mm. to draw up the road map for higher education in the Gambia. You know, initially it was one ministry called Ministry of Education where you had tertiary as part of the ministry. Okay. Uh, but in, in 1999, the Commonwealth Secretary had came and uh, wanted us to give a recommendation of starting a university in the Gambia. To be honest with you, at that time, I thought we were not ready. But I did the consultancy and then gave my recommendations. And uh, the whole process started. So uh, in 1999, the Ministry of Higher Education was set up. And lately, when I came back home, I was given the consultancy to, look, to develop the roadmap for the, for the country. And uh, with that roadmap, 
we really try to set up the ministry proper. It still needs some time for perfection, as all processes are, mm -hmm. but at the same time, at least it led to the High Education Act and policy. But the state of higher education in the Gambia is a recent phenomenon. Okay. It's a very recent phenomenon. Where you think of East Africa, South Africa, Ghana, for example, most of our students used to come to Ghana mm -hmm. for their higher education, Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. uh, but higher education in the Gambia is a very recent phenomenon. But I think the time was due. And uh, the advent of uh, international open university, formerly the online Islamic online university, in 2013, mm. has been a valuable addition, a valuable input into higher education space in the Gambia. Because here was uh, what we call now call the international open university Gambia, because it's registered in the Gambia. Mm trying to widen, facilitate the access for Gambians to higher education. Because okay. often now, you know, whereas other continents are moving forward, we have only a 5% participation rate mm. in higher education. We're not even talking about the nitty gritties yes. of female participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some studies carried in the past where it was being said, stated that until we uh, make an input of 6% of the GDP into higher education, mm. then the road to development will have many bottlenecks. Okay. But higher education, we had the University of the Gambia, mm from 1999 to date, mm. but private higher education such as the Islamic Online University is also making a significant input into access to higher education in the Gambia. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the higher education space with about eight universities, mm. including the national and only university in the Gambia. Mm. Uh, uh, and um, the impact is being felt already. Wow, wow. It's That's already being felt. Wow. And if you take a survey of what we hear from the government side, from the side of the students, mm. and internationally, because we're in about over 220 countries, then it's very encouraging that in spite of the uh, how many years five years right. of existence yeah. in the gambia mm. already impact is being felt mm. and uh, that's encouragement that's it that's a great encouragement especially in higher education mm. especially in higher education in the gambia we are given an operational license we are still trying to pursue the ultimate at the end of the process in terms of uh, getting full recognition of higher education, both at the level of the country and globally across the five continents where we are operating to date. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's, that's wonderful. So uh, as we just learned, the International Open University was formerly the Islamic Online University. So tell us a little bit about the International Open University. Formerly Islamic Online University, mm, there has been a name change. Mm -hmm. uh, remember how Islam has been equated with terrorism? Yes. And up till now. And uh, most of the time, you have things, resources blocked, especially in American banks mm -hmm. and other institutions. And uh, but it's also open mm -hmm. for everybody, mm -hmm. Muslims, non-Muslims, Christians. That's how open it is. Okay. But also to women. Mm -hmm. If 
for a long time we, we talk, we decide, but women, we decide on behalf of women mm -hmm. and not women deciding for themselves. For themselves yes. But also, you know, for a long time, those who are graduating from the madrasas, Islamic schools in the Gambia, they just graduate and that's it. No, they don't have the necessary skills, including communication skills. Mm -hmm. You know, the medium of instruction is in English. Mm -hmm. The medium of communication is also in English at the workplace, place of employment. And uh, it was high time that we tell the whole world, including Gambia and Ghana, that this is an open university. It has not changed the vision and the mission of providing quality higher education, especially for African brothers and sisters. Mm. That is why the one million scholarship is starting right here. If we could do the one million scholarship for Africa, to get the, our youths, male and female, out of these doldrums of poverty, mm. then I think I owe you would have done a great job, a great feat in terms of higher education contribution to development, to socio-economic development, mm. to also alleviating the poverty levels of this continent. Mm. Unfortunately, we just talk day in, day out. For God's sake, let's do something. Mm. And we, we, we believe the strategic partnerships, such as AU, mm. Association of African Universities, can really lead that motherly cord to, to help realize this very, very important partnership. Mm. Ghana is one of the significant countries that we're really banking on. And uh, they're going, doing a great feat in terms of, one, the enrollments here are quite significant. Mm. Two, we have efficient people, the country rep is here. The other partners in Ghana are also very encouraging in terms of the pro proffered proposed support we prepared to give to, to IOU. Mm. It's simply encouraging. Wow. And where there is hope, There's we are all hopeful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but let's be concretize all this mm. support and hope concretely, mm. so that by the, at the end of the day, we are counting not only the cost, but the successes. True. We are counting the impact. Ghana is a very significant country for IOU. Mm. Because when you even talk about the one million scholarship, it's being co-hosted by two country reps. You know, we have a country rep. So each country, mm -hmm. there's a country rep. But uh, we have the Gambian country rep and the Ghanaian country rep, Sam Samudin. And uh, they're really doing very well in coordinating the one million scholarship for Africa. Wow. Yes. It seems you have a very capable group that is really helping to further the interest of uh, International Open University. Now, you, you mentioned the one million scholarship about twice, so we'd like to know in detail what exactly it is. It's uh, the goal is to award one million scholarships by the year 2030. Okay. The SDGs is when? 2035? 2035, yes. And um, we are looking forward and prepared to and taking action as well in terms of awarding these scholarships. It is a process. Mm. They get screened. We make sure that they, they have what it takes to be awarded scholarships. Mm. One, the entry requ uh, requirements to be followed. At least you should have at least five credits at WAS, that's West African Exam School Certificate okay. Exams, mm -hmm. which we share, yes, Ghana, we share. Nigeria, 
Sierra Leone, Gambia, and Liberia. Mm. And um, at least you should you should include English language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, mathematics. Okay. Although these are entry requirements for for students entering university all over the world, mm. but it's more so a way of also ensuring quality. Because mm -hmm. uh, I don't think people do realize the importance of maths and English. Mm -hmm. They think if you are doing history, yes, you have math. You ha you shouldn't. You need to have English. If you're doing the sciences or anything, you need to do maths. But any student pursuing any degree in any university or an institution of higher learning does need communication skills, mm -hmm. but does need analytical skills too. True. If you have those sharp precision skills, you do well, very well any discipline that you decide to pursue in the future wow. for potential university students. Mm. Just, but it's a must. Although we are having real challenges mm. to get the numbers that are required to fulfill this goal of uh, one million scholarship, African scholarship, mm. if we follow the requirements very strictly, and we are doing, we are trying to follow the, because it's quality higher education mm -hmm. yeah. and we cannot compromise quality true what we do in terms of trying to regulate to address some of the challenges that are preventing potential scholarship holders students to get maths and english for to to acquire this scholarship mm. is our collective responsibility yes. Yes. and uh, that's what we are we look forward to Ghana being a key player in this whole million scholarship and uh, the AU for that matter mm -hmm. that's that's a mother and you know what it does mm -hmm. yes but by and large this one million scholarship we're in already in 10 countries mm. uh, Gambia Ghana Sierra Leone Kenya Uganda, 10 to start with. Mm -hmm. But so far, only 50% of this 10 is functional, fully okay. functional. Okay. And uh, we hope to make a, a dent, a significant difference in terms of these scholarships having an impact in the lives of the, the poor who cannot afford higher education. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fine. That's really commendable. So more information about this uh, million uh, scholarship would be on the Islamic University website. It is on the Islamic, is Islamic website, Islam yeah. International, International Open, Open University, University website. website yes. It's still in the process of okay. changing okay. the websites okay. and the other okay. processes. Okay. But um, we've, just, we've been to the Minister mm. of Education this morning mm. and we are yet to formally mm hand you know formally hand over this millions african scholarship to the ghana government okay. yes since he's the minister of education yes, the country rep will will follow it up and we'll formally do we'll do the formal presentation okay, okay. but uh and that's 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 the 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 details are also on the website mm -hmm. The mm. processes, the procedures, mm. what the help desk is also helping. But in Ghana, your country rep is the best person to contact. Okay. It's also put it on the website mm. so that for everybody to have access to mm. and clear on the information required. True. Yeah. True. Mm. Okay. So uh, we. We see that you are the former Minister for Higher Education <laughs> and uh, Scientific Research in the Gambia. So I was wondering uh, some of the policies that were enacted, even though you briefly mentioned on about two of them, I uh, would like to know some of the policies that were enacted to help rapidly develop the higher education space in uh, Gambia. As you said, uh, as you just mentioned, that it has really uh, grown very rapidly in the past five years. Thank you. Mm. 
Um, what we initially did, as I mentioned earlier, was we developed the roadmap mm -hmm. as a consultant. And then from there, the policy on higher education is not a perfect policy, mm -hmm. but at least a framework within which we can work. Okay. What didn't come out very extensively in that policy was private higher education. And this is what is leading us to now International Open University Gambia. Mm. That policy did, did for now, since um, that policy we had declared 2012 mm -hmm. as the year of science and technology in the Gambia. Some work was done, not extensively though, mm -hmm. as one would have expected. And uh, it seemed to have picked up quite recently, mm. where they're really trying to focus on science and technology. Yes, science and technology is important for any country, mm. but it's not the be and, and be it and end of it all. Mm -hmm. Science technology, you have the social sciences. If you work, want to work in a very stable manner, you have to work on legs that are they can carry the equal weight of the body. True. Yes. We have science and technology. That year we thought we will focus on science and technology, especially girls in science and technology. Mm. But with particular reference to SMT, especially maths okay. and engineering. 2003, I, uh, I was very amazed. Mm. That's why earlier I was mentioning the importance of maths. Mm for critical thinkers, mm. people who can analyze. I went to Uganda, we had a science um, fair there. And uh, y y you know, you learn every three days. There was a student, a form three student, a girl, mm -hmm. using biology, you know the blood circulation system, okay. to explain why there are bottlenecks in the transportation system of Uganda. Wow. I said, you, we have it all. Girls also have mm -hmm. it all. Mm -hmm. It's just being given the push. Opportunity as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The conducive environment where they can really excel. Mm -hmm. We all can excel. You can excel. I can excel. You know. But that conducive environment to give them a push is very, very important. Mm -hmm. You know. For all the world, I never associated the blood circulation system in biology in to, transportation. The, to the transportation. I, I said to myself, well, now I've realized mm -hmm. it's not for science for the sake of science, but science for the sake of analyzing your own world mm -hmm. to make it a better world, nice. a peaceful world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a world of co coexistence. Mm -hmm a world where we can tolerate each other mm. but work with that vision. Mm -hmm. yes. that's, that's nice. So you seem to have a lot of interest in students and uh, how they can turn out to be uh, model citizens for the uh, continent. And that in effect will help uh, the whole continent to also grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, what kind of uh, impact or uh, push do you give to students to enable them to uh, be entrepreneurial in their thinking and be able to be critical thinkers so that they can make better decisions and uh, help out? You know, in everything, they are what they call facilitators. Mm. We keep on saying the education system is not working, mm -hmm. but who manages, who administers the education system? facilitators, mm -hmm. but we also need an input. It's a collective responsibility where the participatory process of reflection, planning, mm -hmm. analyzing, forecasting, implementing, monitoring and evaluation can have a whole impact. It's unfortunate that the world, this continent in particular, 
I mean, apart from all these meetings that we are, we are being attended day in, day out, mm -hmm. who don't just sit down and map it out themselves and come up with very concrete plans. Mm -hmm. But the power of communication is also being left out. Mm -hmm. With these students, they are the, the, the most vulnerable group in terms of that age. Stratum. Mm. They need to be communicated to. They need to be guided. They needed to they need to be, you know, told, channeled into what we need for this continent. Mm -hmm. And it's not a one off thing. It should be a consistent perhaps aggressive mm -hmm. way of just Putting it in them, attacking the that hmm? mm -hmm. to help them keep up the vision of developing this continent. Mm. The back way is not that's a deadly grave for very deadly. That's a graveyard. <laughs> Sometimes it makes give me sleepless nights when you think of the numbers that have lost perished mm. in that Mediterranean Sea. Mm the numbers of people languishing in Libyan jails and the world is turning a blind eye on it. Mm. Hmm? I, I wish we get up and do something about it. But let's communicate to our young people. Let's communicate to our youth. Y you know, sometimes you watch these capsized boats and, and women and babies in them. I said, no. What are we doing as a continent? What are we doing to our youth? Mm. Government cannot create jobs for everybody, but at the same time, let us create job creators, mm -hmm. not job seekers. Seek job where? Perish in the Mediterranean Sea? Mm. Hmm? Or make them create, have the confidence, self-confidence in them to say, hey, if I create that and sell it, I can make a decent living. It will keep me off the prisons or off anywhere mm -hmm. where you know troublemakers are taken to. True. If I can do that, I can teach the others to be e e equally entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the dignity that you do your work here. Most of our youths go to the West. What they refuse to do at home is worse than they are doing in the mm -hmm. West. But we have to communicate, we have to hit that psyche on them and keep on telling them you can make it and you can make it better where you are. Mm. You can make it better where you are. It's not the El Dorado anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe in those colonial days it used to be rosy mm -hmm. when they needed mm -hmm. the labor that was supplied, especially from the Africans. Mm -hmm. They don't need them anymore. Yeah. See how the People from Lebanon were being hided and kicked out and I think let's come go back to the youth. Mm. Communicate to them. Help them think. They're very vulnerable. And they easily carried away. Mm. Yeah. Get them the skills they require. Language skills, those are communication skills. Once you can communicate, you can go a long way. True. To teach them to communicate as well. Mm -hmm. Because they, if they have their problems and keep it themselves. A slightest iota of something can mm. whisk them out. Yes. True. But they can use their hands. They're very intelligent. Mm. Go to the average uh, outside, you know, be it Kenya, be it here, and you talk to the people whom you think are the dregs of society. Mm. You, you know, you talk to them and they easily come around. And uh, they, they, they're very proud to show you that what they've done mm -hmm. in the next month or so. See how important communication is? True. Let's communicate to our youth. Mm. Let's help them, let's guide them, or tell them the potential is greater here for themselves, for their families, for their communities, mm. and for the African continent, and even for the whole world at large. True. True. Yes. True. Let's communicate to them. Good. Well. I have a very firm conviction that the more we communicate to them, 
the more we get them around. Mm. The more we'll save them from the Eldorado that they th thinking it's rosy, mm. the mm. grass is greener on the so other side, mm. only to meet the wasteful death. True. True. In the desert, in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and being herded in, in uh, like animals. Libya, what is Libya? An African continent. Yes. But then they more consider themselves in the Arab world than That's anything. True. That's true. Do we deserve to be put in prisons and treated in a very dehumanized manner? We just need to talk to these people and tell them, come back to where you belong. True. And we can make a better world. True. True. Okay, Dr. Mariama, uh, it's been a wonderful discussion today. We're just wondering if there are any last words you'd like to say to the whole of Africa. I would uh, first of all solicit the cooperation of the leadership of this continent. The leadership has a lot to, be, to account for. Uh, sometimes I look at it as if it's taking one step forward and ten steps ten step backwards. Steps. Because a leader comes on board and you think you are all hopeful. And then we move from bad to worse. And uh, with that leadership, the youth is getting more disgruntled. Some of them try to air it out in the wrong manner. Mm. Go out in the street, destroy vehicles. And... Uh, but if only this corporate responsibility was being seen through the effective contribution of the parents also, it can make a whole lot of a difference. Mm. You see, it, it's, it's not one man show. The leadership has a lot to, a lot to be desired mm. in terms of how they really trying to look at what's happening in the material. Nobody's saying anything. Mm -hmm. I've not heard even Ghana itself say mm. anything about the, I mean, the papers are there, that's mm. the news, the, the social media. Mm. But can't we get up and do something about it? That's the leadership. Mm. But the parental responsibility also has a great role to play. Yes, you know, <laughs> our grandparents have done a lot. Our parents have done a lot. Mm what we are losing out in terms of that parental responsibility. The school cannot take the place of the family mm -hmm. in terms of bringing up these children. Hmm? If you abdicate that role to the school, mm -mm. the school is just a microcosm of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this whole continent and to the whole world, we really need to play our rightful roles and create this peaceful world that we've been looking for. True. Yes. True. And I, we pray to God that it happens sooner than later mm -hmm. to avoid the, the continuous loss of lives, of livelihoods, of parental links, mm. of peaceful coexistence and all that it takes. But I'm still hopeful for the continent. Yeah, there is also. I'm still hopeful for the continent. And it's not the continent alone. No one is free until everybody is free. True. You see, at some point they thought they don't need them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the migrants anymore. Mm -hmm. The migrants now came in to their backyard. True. Yes. The leadership also needs to know that. It's a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. yes. So I think with the leadership and the everybody taking the responsible, rightful roles, we can go back to the days that we've yearned for. Mm. Biblically, Quranically. Mm. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mariama Sarsesi. It's been a, a pleasure to host you on this show. Uh, you've been able to help to enlighten us about the higher education scope 
in uh, Gambia. And we, we've been pleased to also learn about the International Open University. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, Frank. Right. Thank you, Frank. Yes. So viewers, thank you very much for joining us for this edition of AU Talks on AU TV. Uh, we had a very wonderful discussion and seeing the higher education scope in the Gambia. And we hope to catch you on another uh, episode of AU Talks. For, for now, I would say bye and we'll, see, we'll meet again later. Thank you. This is Event Update on AAU TV, the voice of higher education in Africa. Event Update brings you information about upcoming higher education events happening in Africa. And it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. I am Isabella Teta Hinakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpaba Jansson. The Woodrow Wilson Center Fellowship is open to international students from all over the world who intend to undertake postdoctoral studies at Wilson Center USA. This fellowship aims to unite the world of thought with the world of policy by promoting a preeminent scholarship and connecting that scholarship to problems of interest to authorities in Washington. Expected applicants are academics, professionals, reporters, and government intellectuals. To be eligible, you must have an outstanding capabilities and experience from a wide variety of backgrounds, citizen or permanent resident from any country, a PhD, an academic candidate demonstrating scholarly achievements by publications beyond their doctoral dissertation, practitioners or policy makers with an equivalent level of professional achievement as well as English proficiency. For more details, kindly visit www.wilsoncenter.org slash fellowship dash application dash guidelines. La bourse du Woodrow Wilson Center est ouverte aux étudiants internationaux du monde entier qui ont l'intention d'entreprendre des études postdoctorales au Wilson Center aux états unis Cette bourse vise à unir le monde des pensées avec le monde de la politique en promouvant une érudition préminente et en reliant cette bourse à des problèmes d'intérêt pour les autorités de Washington. Les candidats attendus sont des universitaires, des professionnels, des journalistes et des intellectuels du gouvernement. Pour être éligible, vous devez avoir une capacité remarquable et une grande variété d'expériences, être citoyen ou résident permanent de n'importe quel pays, avoir un doctorat, être un candidat universitaire démontrant une réussite universitaire par des publications au-delà de sa thèse de doctorat, 
est praticien ou décideur ayant un niveau équivalent de réussite professionnelle ainsi qu'avoir la maîtrise de l'anglais. Pour plus de détails, veuillez visiter www.wccenter.org barre fellowship application guidelines. Application is open for TED Fellows Program 2020. TED is a non-profit devoted to spreading ideas usually in the form of short, powerful talks. This program convenes young world changers, academics and trailblazers who have shown unusual accomplishments and exceptional courage in their respective disciplines, selected through an intensive application, interview and research process. It provides transformational support to a global network of 490 plus visionaries, scientists, academic researchers, artists, activists, entrepreneurs, doctors, journalists and inventors who collaborate and share new ideas and research across disciplines to create positive change around the world. The organizers are looking for doers, makers, inventors, advocates, filmmakers and photographers, musicians and artists scientists, entrepreneurs, NGO heads, and human rights activists to apply before 24th August 2020. In addition to impressive accomplishments, fine character and a good heart are also important traits. For more information, kindly email contact at TED.com or visit www.TED.com. La candidature est ouverte pour le programme nommé TED Fellows Program 2020. TED est une organisation à but non lucratif qui se consacre à la diffusion d'idées généralement sous la forme de cours et puissants exposés. Ce programme réunit des jeunes dont les idées font progresser le monde des universitaires et des pionniers qui ont fait preuve d'un accomplissement inhabituel et d'un courage exceptionnel dans leurs disciplines respectives sélectionnées à l'issue d'un processus intensif de candidature, d'entretien et de recherche. Il apporte un soutien transformationnel à un réseau mondial de plus de 490 visionnaires, scientifiques, chercheurs universitaires, artistes, activistes, entrepreneurs, médecins, journalistes et inventeurs qui collaborent et partagent de nouvelles idées et recherchent dans toutes les disciplines afin de créer un changement positif dans le monde entier. Les organisateurs recherchent des faiseurs, fabricants, inventeurs, défenseurs, cinéastes et photographes, musiciens et artistes scientifiques, entrepreneurs, responsables d'ONG et militants de droits de l'homme pour poser leur candidature avant le 24 août 2020. En plus d'une réalisation impressionnante, un bon caractère et un bon cœur sont également des traits importants. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez envoyer un courriel à contact.ted.com ou consulter le site www.ted.com. The National Agricultural Research Organization and Macquarie University College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, NAROMAC, is pleased to invite you to the third International Scientific Conference, NAROMAC 2020, to be held in Kampala, Uganda from 10th to 13th November 2020 under the theme Innovations for Enhancing Productivity and Agro-Industrialization. This conference is also inviting researchers, academia, producers, processes, marketers, consumers, policy makers, among others, to submit abstracts for this third NAROMAC Joint Scientific Conference. The abstract should be directly linked to the conference theme and to a sub-theme. It should not exceed 300 words and should contain a clear title and affiliation of all authors. Interested authors and participants are to register or submit abstracts online at www.naromac.com conference.org slash abstract dash management dash system slash before 31st August 2020. For more information, please contact Naroma Conference at caes.mac.ac.org or technology promotional at narom.go.ug or call plus 256-414-320325 or plus 256-414-320325. You can also visit the conference website www.naromaconference.org. L'Organisation Nationale de Recherche Agricole et le Collège Universitaire des Sciences Agricoles et Environnementales de Makerere, Naromac, ont le plaisir de vous inviter à la troisième conférence scientifique internationale Naromac 2020, qui se tiendra à Kampala, en Ouganda, au 10, du 10 au 13 novembre 2020, sous le thème « Innovation pour améliorer la productivité et l'agro-industrialisation ». 
Cette conférence invite également des chercheurs et universitaires, des producteurs, de, des transformateurs, des spécialistes de marketing, des consommateurs, des décideurs, entre autres, à soumettre des résumés pour cette troisième conférence scientifique conjointe à Romac. Le résumé doit être directement lié au thème de la conférence et à un sous-thème. Il ne doit pas dépasser 300 mots et doit contenir un titre clair et une affiliation de tous les auteurs. Les auteurs et participants intéressés doivent s'inscrire ou soumettre leur résumé en ligne via www.aromaconference.org barre abstract management système avant le 31 août 2020. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter Naroma Conference à caes.mac.ac.org ou technologie promotionna à base naro.go.ug. Vous pouvez également appeler le plus 256 41 43 23 25 ou 256 41 45 42 277. Submission of abstracts and papers have been opened for the Botho University International Research Conference BUIRC 2020, which is scheduled from 25th to 27th November 2020 at Botho University, Gaborone, Botswana. On the theme, Research and Innovation for Sustainable Development in the Age of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. All abstracts and papers should include the title of the paper, names of the author and institution affiliation, complete postal address and contact details. Interested authors are to submit their papers before 31st August 2020. For more information, please contact BUIRC 2020 at bothouniversity.ac.bw or visit www.bothouniversity.ac.bw slash BUIRC. La soumission des résumés et des articles est ouverte pour la conférence internationale sur la recherche de l'Université Boto BUIRC 2020 qui est prévue du 25 au 26 novembre 2020 à l'Université Boto à Gaboron, Botswana sur le thème « La recherche et l'innovation au service du développement durable à l'ère de la quatrième révolution industrielle ». Tous les résumés et articles doivent inclure le titre de l'article, les noms de l'auteur et l'affiliation institutionnelle, l'adresse postale complète et les coordonnées. Les auteurs intéressés doivent soumettre leur article avant le 31 août 2020. Pour plus d'informations, veuillez contacter buirc 2020botouniversityacbw ou visiter www.botouniversityacbw barre buirc. That is all for today's update. Event update is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. Please follow us on our social media platforms at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAU TV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAU TV Official on Instagram. You can also visit our dedicated website at tv.aau.org for more of event updates. I am Isabella Tetahenakwa. Je m'appelle Alexandra Mpaba Johnson. Culture has been very relevant in our country. If you are trying to paint a picture, paint a full picture. Don't paint half of the picture. You spoke very well. I mean, you command the English language. What picture are you trying to paint? Clay, we got 54. Four. And. So you welcome to the Yaz Intellectuals Debate Show, the first of its kind right here in the country. It is a reality debate show. And my name is Edujen Fier and I'm here with Nanaba Amwa. And we are in the beautiful garden city of Kumasi. And already we've seen quite some interesting halls meeting up with great results, great thinkers, great analysis by all the debaters. And I'm sure this particular encounter between the two halls are also going to be 
very, very interesting. All right. So we would like to acknowledge our sponsors. And we are proudly sponsored by Yaz, Yaz range of products, the caring brand for caring families, Capital O2, producers of Living Bitters, and FCF. And we are also supported by Access Bank. All right. So our debaters are very much ready. We'll be introducing them very, very soon. But we take a very short break. Twenty first century design made with durable materials. Bristles crafted to reach in between your teeth. Flexible allows easy control. Introducing Yaz range of toothbrushes made for every pocket. For bulk purchases, call zero three zero two two three. 5294 Yaz toothbrushes clean teeth confident smile Welcome back from that commercial yes we are continuing on with the debate and today we have two halls from the campus of University of Cape Coast and we have the Adeshe Hall Adishi Hall, as we all know, is an all-female hall, and for that matter, we strive so hard to make sure that we produce prominent women. This hall trains women to become great women in future. Our motto is um, to educate a woman is to educate a nation. You'll get everything in Adishi. We have the three Bs, the boldness, the beauty, and then the brains. We are fully prepared. In fact, we don't make unnecessary noise. We are beautiful and we have brains, and I think that is a plus to the whole. How the debate is going to be, it's going to be mad fun. Very interesting. We will go very, very far. And the name of Adish Hall will really hit Ghana. To prove to all other halls and other investors that Adish is one of a kind. For people to know that, yes, we have just one female hall in Ghana, and that is Adish Hall. We are going to make history in the whole of Ghana. And then with the boldness, we are bringing it to you at the intellectuals. Meet us there and you find our boldness shining. And the Kwame Nkrumah Hall. Kwame Nkrumah Hall is known to be Hall of Excellence on campus. This hall is known to produce the best intellectuals, like I'm not bragging, but seriously, we have been known to produce the first class holders and the likes. Now, when it comes to academics, we are the best. Currently, the are all best students of Investor of Cape Coast is an athlete of Kwame Nkrumah Hall. Nothing more else but the best, because we are the best. We are noticed to be one of the best halls when you come to University of Cape Coast. So we are a hall of excellence. We are wrapping life on the intellectuals. Kwame Nkrumah Hall is going to come out on top. Our chances of winning is very high because we produce the great and best students of the school and across Ghana. We are going to be the pacers of this upcoming debate. We are ready for the battle. We are hopefully going to win this trophy. Kwame Nkrumah is known for leadership by example. Leadership by example, we are going to make an example to the whole nation and to the University of Cape Coast as well. And today, their topic for debate is going to be on Ghana is considered as an agrarian economy, but agriculture is not the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. Habna, kindly introduce our moderators for today's debate. All right, so we have great moderators with us here, and they are going to make sure uh, they tally their results very much, and they are going to give us a very great result for that matter. And so, Without wasting my time, let me uh, quickly introduce Dr. Oseni Adams. Uh, he's one of our moderators. Shall we give him a round of applause? We also have with us uh, Professor Goski Alabi. Another round of applause for her. And Eva Green, Professor Martin Ousu. Round of applause for him. We are very much grateful for your presence. Okay, so Kwame Nkrumah Hall is going to speak for the motion whilst Adeshi Hall speaks against the motion and a few points to note please debaters when you hear the bell ring once it means you have thank you very much it means you have done one minute of your time when you hear it ring twice it means you have two minutes left and when you hear the bell being rung continuously 
that means your time is up for your assertion and kindly desist from trying to speak further afterwards. Mr. Chairman, panel of judges, our great timekeeper, co-debaters, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Esther Dara from University of Cape Coast representing Kwame Nkrumah Hall and I'm here as a principal speaker to speak in favor of the motion, I quote, Ghana is considered as an agrarian economy, but agriculture is not the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. Panel, before I move on, allow me to define some key terms in the motion. So when we talk about agrarian economy, what do we mean? When we talk about something being a backbone, what do we mean? To that extent, when we say agriculture is the backbone of a Ghanaian economy, what do we mean by that? So basically, agrarian economy is that economy that involves agriculture, right? So maybe I have um, a farmland, a very small farmland or a garden, and then I decide that, oh, I'm going to plant um, crops on it, and I, maybe pepper or tomatoes. Now they are ready to be picked. Then maybe I realize I could actually consume it myself, or maybe sell it in a small market. But on a second thought, I decide that, no, let me rather broaden this farm and produce more so that I can rather supply maybe regionally, nationally, or even internationally. So that is just a characteristic of an agrarian economy. Okay, so according to the Miriam Webster, that was one of the strongest parts, okay, or something. So if you are saying that agriculture is a part of an economy, then you are saying that agriculture is the strongest part of an economy. Then if you are saying strongest, mind you, it's like you're saying, that means that there are other things, right? But that particular one is the strongest. So that means you're saying that, look, um, agriculture is the strongest part of the Ghanaian economy. Now, what makes up an economy? We have three sectors, right? We have um, agriculture, we have service, and we have industry. So what I will do is to prove to you that indeed agriculture is not the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. Come on, we can say on the old that the backbone of the Ghanaian economy those days that agriculture produced to feed um, the economy very, very well and that we didn't have to import to do any other thing aside depending on our, our economy. But the economy or the nation was faced with or have been faced with increasing population, which has really made agriculture's contribution strong. And so we can see that over the years, agriculture's contribution to the economy has always been declining. And this I will put to you through statistics. So my point again will be contribution to GDP, importation of agricultural products, and size of uh, labor force. I will explain this. So now when we talk about contribution to GDP. With respect to the GDP, the statistics I'm going to talk to you about from the various sectors of the economy of the GDP, according to CIA World Facts Book, which was last updated on the 20th of January 2008, and to know that agriculture has contributed 18.5%, industry contributed 25.6%, and then services contributed 57.2%. Okay, so uh, basically you can see that agriculture has contributed the least to the um, economy in terms of the GDP. And that is not even the only contribution, the only low con uh, contribution of agriculture because over the year 1990, uh, 2009, it dropped in 2010, 2011, it kept on dropping. For the sake of time, I would want to analyze that indeed, as you can see those statistics, agriculture has not contributed even to the uh, growing of our GDP. So, when I want to start and say that agriculture is not important, okay? So, I want to draw a difference between something being the backbone, something being important. We can never deny the fact that agriculture has always been contributing greatly to our economy. But then, if we look at this contribution, even as I read the statistics, look at this contribution, as compared to the other sectors, should we then leave the other sectors who are contributing greatly and name agriculture or tax agriculture as the backbone? And in that, another way, we can say that the strongest part of the Ghanaian economy, but I said that the Ghanaian economy is made up of three sectors the service industry and then agriculture. I move forward to talk about agriculture. I move forward to talk about importation of agriculture, but 
Uh, recall everyone is saying agriculture is the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. Then I believe, or I feel that its contribution should be so great that it doesn't even cost us to import even the major agriculture products into this nation. So we have um, farmers crying always about the postcard laws due to the fact that they do not have storage facilities which could actually preserve the products that they are always producing. Hence, cotton laws because the government is forced to import goods and cultural products. This agriculture we are, we are trying to turn out the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. The government is forced to uh, import agricultural products that are the major distance in the economy, into this country. And do you know what that does to the economy? It makes us in care debt, which goes a long way to devalue our currency. Um, agriculture, I also make an analysis on the size of labor force. Okay? So I have some statistics here with me to prove the contribution of each sector in terms of um, labor force, employing the labor force. So, um, the ICI World Facts book on 20th January 2018 made the below findings on labor force and occupation level. So, agriculture employs 44.7%, industry employs 4.4%, services employs 40.9%. So, that, we could actually say that agriculture employs the greatest, right? The largest number. Now, why is it that should we name agriculture? Should we say agriculture is the backbone of an economy? Where it is employing the largest, right? Granted, it is employing the largest, but productivity, we do not see it being the largest productive, whatever. So, my point here is if we want to make this analysis, if I am employing more people, then I should expect that that sector should produce more, right? So, in a case where other sectors are producing less, but they are the ones contributing greatly to the economical development of this nation or economic development of this nation. And of course, we have employing the larger labor force, yet it is producing the least. Every year, it is decreasing. And they are the ones to increase, but they don't realize it decreases again. In fact, come on. We have been important so much so that the president of the African Development Bank, Mr. Akemi Adesa, Say that Ghana, you have no business importing rice worth 400 million US dollars every year. This is the sector we are seeing as the backbone of a Ghanaian economy. This we find as very problematic and it cannot stand in this house. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also, a round of applause for her, Kwame Nkrumah Hall from the University of Cape Coast. We now call on the principal speaker against the motion. The panel, co-debaters, students, good evening. The role of agriculture towards the economic development of Ghana can never on any day be downplayed. For the purposes of this debate, I would love to redefine some of the key elements within the motion. Now, to say that the economy of a country is agrarian means that that economy is centered on the production, consumption, and distribution of agricultural commodities. Now, to say that... Um, to say that something is the backbone of an economy means that it should provide fundamental support to the economy such that in its absence, all other sectors of the economy will suffer. Now, having said that, my primary ob objective here this evening is to prove to you with relevant examples, historical antecedents, and statistical review that agriculture has been and is still the backbone of Ghana's economy. Now, the issue here isn't about the challenges that agriculture is facing because take any other sector, talk of the services or the industry, they have their own challenges. But the question here is, amidst all these challenges, can we only still say that agriculture is the backbone of the economy? And by the time I'm done with my submission, we'll all come to the tent to believe that agriculture is indeed before I proceed, I would love to give some historical antecedents towards the revolution of agriculture in Ghana. Now, under the Nkrumah-led administration, they, they resorted to what we call state farm and cooperative farm to restructure the economic system. Now, the military regimes that also came after the Nkrumah-led administration, a, a typical example like the National Redemption Council, sought to, to restructure the economic system of the country, thereby resorting to the operation Feed Yourself, which solved a major national crisis. Now, in current 
current times, the, the administration that we have is also looking at restructuring the agricultural sector so that the economy of the country can be in a good stance. So they resort to the planting, food, and jobs. Now, let me proceed to my point. To say that something is the backbone of an economy means that it must contribute immensely towards the economic indicators of the country. That is employment, trade, industrialization, exports, and imports. So it's my main point, and the employment. Agriculture remains the one and only sector that continuously employs a large number of the working force of the country. Now, opposite, um, the, the side government comes to actually prove the fact that agriculture is the one sector that is employing a large number of the working force of the country. Now, employment is a, a big economic indicator when it comes to economy of a country. Let's take it that we take agriculture out. It means that all this number of people are going to remain what, unemployed. Now, when there's um, unemployment, there, there is social vices and when there's a um, high rate of social vices it brings a poor economic outlook onto the country such that investors and for foreign investors are unwilling to even come into the country in the first place to even invest so by this it means that agriculture remains the only sector that supports the own unemployment that is able to cater for unemployment within the country having said this we cannot dispute the fact that it is the backbone of the economy because when you take it out it means that the working force of the country is going to suffer to a large extent now i'll give you statistical review to show that indeed agriculture is the largest um, employer of our people now according to the Ghana standard survey of the labor force report in 2014 it says that agriculture employed 44.3% of the working population and it continues to feed the, uh, or it is a source of livelihood for people that are directly and indirectly employed under the agricultural sector directly because we have people that are directly engage in farming fishing livestock and all that now we have people that are also selling the finished products that come from agriculture so to a large extent it is actually catching for the unemployment rate that we are having in the country so you take it out and then you, you break you take it out and then we rather have a country that has high unemployment leading to so many other issues within the country now as i said to gdp is also a factor when it comes to studying the economy of a country now let me give you the definition of gdp it says that gross domestic product is the sum total of a country's consumption, government expenditure, investment, net exports, and net imports. Now, according to our, G our GDP, the only sector that is enabling us Basically, what our, our members came to do is to tell us that we are importing, and for that matter, agriculture isn't. We are importing so high, for that matter, agriculture isn't the backbone of the country's economy. And I say that, listen, the global world is, is such that countries have become interdependent on each other. No country does not import. One way or the other, we all import. We have even developed countries importing from non-developed countries. So the issue of importation, we do agree that, yes, we are importing high. But then we also consider the fact that when it comes to exportation, this is the one and only sector which we derive materials to even export, which in the end generates foreign income to the development of the country. Now, I realize that if you are importing and you are not exporting, then you are doing yourself more harm. But in an instance where you are importing, but then you still have something to rely on, you still have one sector that continues to feed you what you export to other countries, then you cannot say that that, country, that, that sector isn't the backbone of the economy. Now, I'll, put, I'll proceed to my third point. To say that agriculture is the backbone of Ghana's economy means that when you take agriculture out, other sectors are going to suffer. Now, she did mention the fact that we have three sectors, the industry, the service providers and agriculture in itself. You take industry, under industry we have the mining, the manufacturing industries. Under the manufacturing industries, industries, you find out that it is agriculture that is actually feeding these industries to be able to even turn their raw materials into finished goods and even sell it to the market. You take agriculture out and all these industries are going to suffer. Talk about industries like the Nestle Ghana, it's about industries like Farmbook, all these industries are manufacturing industries that are even employing people, but all their work solely is relied on agriculture. So you take um, agriculture out and all these industries are going to one way or the other directly or indirectly suffer. Now you take the service providers, the service, the service providers, you say services is anything that is intangible. In other words, you can't see it. It is provided. You take something like the health sector, tourism and hospitality, which you have the restaurants, the hotels and, and um, our tourist sites. Now, one thing that is helping the economy of Ghana is our tourism and our recreational centers that we have. Now all these facilities, all these recreational centers that we have, like the Kakum National Park, the Ibri Gardens, all these things form forestry, which comes under agriculture. So even under services, agriculture plays a major role. We talk about the service providers like the restaurants, the hotels. Without agriculture, all these service providers, providers are going to one way or the other be affected. We talk about um, industry, we also have um, what we call transportation and storage. Now, 
according to the GDP of Ghana, transportation and storage adds 11.6 percent, and that is from the Ghana Statistical Service to the GDP. Now, storage facilities are basically built for the purposes of storing agricultural materials. Without agricultural materials, without the intention to store materials, there will be no need for storage facilities. Now, when it comes to, to transport, you see that. What we normally um, send from one point to the other are agricultural commodities. If our roads are not in good shape, if our roads are not functioning the way they are, you realize that commodities that have to be transported to places, there will be um, a, a, a gap, there will be, it will be non-functional. So that alone will even lead to inflation because when you are not able to um, get your goods out there into the market to sell, the non-availability of good roads actually will lead to inflation because when you are not able to get the pro um, products, it means that demand and De demand becomes high. So it tells you that even under services, they rely strongly on agriculture to feed them. Even under industries, they are all looking up to agriculture to feed them. And especially in a developing country where we are not even at the, at the age where we can say that our services are on point. Like we cannot compare ourselves to America. We cannot downplay the role that agriculture plays in our economic development. What have I brought so far in this debate? I've made us understand that yes, for the, for the sole purpose that agriculture employs a large number of the working force of the country alone indicates that it is the backbone of the economy because you take it out and all these people are going to remain unemployed. Thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. Wide wings and leak guards. Yes, sanitary pads give you maximum comfort, hygiene, and protection in a resealable pack. We've got Yas Protection. Yes, sanitary pads. Maximum protection, maximum confidence. No worry, we've got Yas Protection. The panel of the house. The motion before this house is Ghana is considered as an agrarian economy, but agriculture is not the backbone of the Ghanaian economy. Now, panel, if you would listen carefully to what my dear debate on the other side said, basically she did not listen to the explanation given by my principal speaker. Now you come here and you say a lot of stuff, but you don't say concretely what we're talking about. The fact that you produce the large employment force doesn't make you the backbone. I tell you, let us make a comparison with China. China is an agrarian country, is an agrarian country, an agrarian economy, but agriculture contributes to just 10%. China, it, their major contribution of their GDP is mining. So, but when you look deeply into the GDP of China, you get to see that the high number of people that are working in China are into agriculture. But that doesn't mean that it is their backbone. If you listen to the definition given by my principal speaker, she said that when we talk about backbone, it means it is the strongest part of something. And she said something that I really got disappointed at. She said that we, we cannot downpen the, uh, the importance of agriculture. We, we are not in the GDP to us. That makes my debate.